Good morning, everyone. I'm Patrick from uh, Required Magic. Um, it's a bit of extended housekeeping uh, to be done before we, before we start the rest of the uh, event. And I need to, this is a, is a six month, six minute um, presentation. <clears throat> so even though I can hardly see you, um, could everyone raise your, your hands if you've heard of cardiac arrest? Okay, not bad, not bad. Probably, hopefully not because of me. Um, <laughs> who's heard of a heart attack? Come on, come on. That's it. Uh, how many of you think it's the same thing? The audience is pre-prepared. Um, so, because they're not the same thing. They're definitely not the same thing. It globally it claims more, more lives than all those uh, conditions put together. Um, and cardiac arrest, sudden, sudden cardiac arrest, uh, strikes with no, without warning and no apparent reason. And physical fitness has nothing to do with it. So very recently at uh, the Euros, uh, Christian Eriksen collapsed with a, with a sudden cardiac arrest. Um, um, more recently than that, there was a 13-year-old year boy who collapsed and died on the football pitch in the UK. Um, the common element is not that they were both playing football, by the way. Um, and of course, recently, uh, a presenter at OpenSUSE Con 2019 collapsed mid-presentation. Any guesses? Um, by, the, by the time this presentation is over, three people will be dead in the US because of cardiac arrest. Now think about that. It's three people in the US or six people in the entire EU every six minutes. And it's a real, it's a real, it's a real problem, but it's a lot, um, there's not so much education about it. So if you see someone drop dead or just fall over, you need to check to see if there's a pulse. If there isn't a pulse, you need to start doing the CPR the old cardiac massage, immediately if there's no pulse. And don't stop until you're told by a medical expert or a doctor or an ambulance worker. And don't worry, this is the best thing, don't worry if you hear um, cracked, you know, cracking ribs. You can't do bad CPR because the alternative is the person dies. Um, and by the way, it's not Hollywood. Uh, CPR could take half an hour or more. The idea of CPR is to get the, the heart pumping blood to the brain, oxygenated blood to the brain. Um, so n no CPR is, is, is uh, way worse than bad CPR. Uh, find an AED, which is a portable um, a, a automated uh, defibrillator. There's one of them in this building. Um, there's one in many, many public places, uh, and use it. It's, it's automated, it tells you what to do, and if you start using it, again, this is not Hollywood, um, 20 shocks is, uh, is, or more is not uncommon. uncommon. So survival is, is possible. I mean, on the, on the bright side, it sounds like a negative topic, but your, your actions can save a life. Um, and people don't just drop dead. It's usually a sudden cardiac arrest. CPR is, a, CPR is essential. Don't stop until... Um, and don't find someone else to do it. Do it yourself, but there's no one handy. Because you've got six minutes before brain damage starts occurring. <clears throat> The heart feeds the oxygenated blood to the, to the brain and your, your actions stimulate the heartbeat, forcing blood flow to the brain. Um, and it's only six minutes before things start to shutting down on the brain. So, simple summary. Dial 99 or whatever, whatever your relevant uh, emergency code is. Start CPR and find an AED. If you're the only person there, start CPR and call someone to find an AED and call the emergency number. Um, one thing that I didn't know, I don't, didn't know any of this uh, a couple of years ago, but one thing I definitely didn't know, which would have been very handy, is every single mobile phone has got an emergency function. 
that emergency function is just a, a bit of data you put in there about your medications, your any uh, diseases you've got, uh, and most importantly, contact numbers of uh, people that you you would like to be informed of uh, in the case of a of a, co of a collapse. Um, it's uh, I'm not sure if you can actually no this laser's not bleh, no didn't want to do that. Um, sorry. Um, so these, these, every phone's got this, this um, emergency function there. Um, take some notes, some moments now or, or very, very soon to just put all that information into your, into your phone. Because you might not have heard of, of the existence of that, but every other emergency service worker looks for it. And everyone, everyone who, who, who's looking after you is looking for it, and if there's nothing there, it makes it a lot more difficult to get to the right person. Um, so, um, so if you have to render experience, uh, assistance to someone, check their mobile, inform the appropriate people, and but not before you've done everything else. So you can make a difference and actually allow someone to to, to live. Um, so that's it. I dedicate this to the people who saved my life almost exactly three years ago in this place, um, and you all know who you are. Um, one more thing, the emergency the exits are well labelled and there is an AED on site, so let's get on with the show. So as I was saying uh, three years ago, now where did I... I don't know what I was doing then, but I certainly now know that I'm talking about rolling out Linux using something called Carpet. Um, I started this presentation back in 2019, but I wasn't quite able to finish it. Um, now Doug mentioned that there's some people found that found the topic interesting, and I thought, what, me? Interesting? What? Okay, so I'm back after two years of COVID and other things to talk about rolling out carpet and Linux on just about anything, anywhere. A bit about me. Um, problem solver since 1974, that's when I first got my collection of Lego. Um, later than that, I was working in film, um, in special, physical special effects, wind, rain, fire, all those kind of things. Um, on IMDB, you could actually find my name, but it's it's an actor who's kind of purloined all the work that I did. You know, I can't be bothered to fix that. Um, so I'm a special effects technician, not an actor, and I was on, worked on something like 20 different programs. <clears throat> um, but what I found fairly recently is I realized that a lot of the, a, a lot of the things that working in film have in, in common with technology, it's a lot of problem solving. Um, now I started working, started uh, programming on a Challenger 4P with 8K of RAM, which is just nuts, but then moved on to working film. Um, and what we do, what iLayer and Required Magic, which is the second company, uh, work, uh, iLayer or Innovation Layer is a consultancy uh, and also an MSP uh, managing, so managing cloud services in London, in uh, in Zurich, um, I have staff in South Africa and London and, and Germany with me here. Um, during one of the consulting requirements, uh, engagements, we needed to work on a, on a homegrown deployment scheme, which led to me developing carpet. Um, but let's go back to film for a moment. Um, this is a classic line that makes producers of films very, very nervous. Because when the script says something like that, that's called the one million dollar sentence. And that's because you don't know what the director is going to do with it when he reads it. And what he, how is he going to interpret it? It could be something as simple as pick someone, uh, an actor picks up a newspaper and sees a, seeing a headline or a photograph. Or it might be uh, Saving Private Ryan with 
you know, the entire basis of you know, millions and millions of pe uh, dollars in, in special effects work. Similarly, let's deploy a new OS. <laughs> has the you know a lot of the a lot of the same things it's, I mean if you think about that previous slide the sa the same thing the same things apply here so you've got justification the question is you know, uh, uh, why the cost logistics the manpower and at the end uh, end uh, end of the day what are the results and these are all the kind of things that we probably have all uh, suffered with and 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 had thrown back at us whenever we decided to, you know, we tried to deploy Linux on, on multiple systems. They're the kind of answers, get, the questions to get asked. So essentially it's the huh, the what, and the why, and the how. Um, and of course the cost. Um, which is why we, you know, we, we started working on a project. Um, and carpet which was formerly known as a SNP here. I didn't, know, and didn't like the name either, um, but I thought Carpet was much better. <clears throat> uh, it remotely deploys Linux using Wake on LAN, Pixie Boot, and the native installer. It doesn't, it's not an imaging tool. Um, oh. Yeah. So it's it's not a, it's not an image tool. It's not a dumbing a dumbing imaging tool or even a a smart one. Um, you can deploy images, and we'll see that actually happening a bit later on. Um, though the best experience is is ha is having uh, the native Linux installer using some preseed files to to install the Linux on the, on the machine in a native fashion. Um, it's more reliable that way because it does the uh, the image the uh, the hardware detection. <clears throat> um, one thing it's not is a cure of cancer unless you think Windows is a cancer, in which case it is. Um, so we can deploy workstations, we can de deploy digital signage and kiosks, uh, we can do deployment over a WAN with um, with, with virtual machines, uh, WAN images uh, or WAN installations over narrow bandwidth. Things like, you know, big, the big one is at the moment is automotive systems. Um, Internet of Things is another, is another possibility. But any way you want Linux is, you can deploy it using our, our system. Um, so the things we need, the requirements uh, is, Obviously a network, um, but you don't need to worry about a, a low bandwidth endpoint network. Um, closed network environments also are, are fine if you're willing to install a couple of servers. Um, Pixie Boot is, is, a, is a requirement for the uh, hardware to be able to load the remote installer. Wake on LAN is, is also very nice because you can just send a packet, wake up the system and it can get installed. That's not a, a necessity. And of course, DHCP, which you think is common and a lot of places it isn't. Um, even large or, uh, organizations like universities. Um, so we did this work uh, with, with Allied Irish Bank. Um, there's a, a case study available. We're looking after 7,500 Linux desktops using a, a command line tool that they'd written as across 900 branches. Uh, that we're updating every system uh, on a roughly a bi-weekly basis um, to a, an estate which was uh, from 2004. Um, and we did all this with zero site visits. We never went to a single branch. And these are the systems that the, the bank tellers would use when they're interacting with, you, with, the, with the customer. So... If you think about the cost to deploy a new system or even like a brand new um, laptop or, or, or a desktop system, you really need to think about how long it's going to take in, in man hours. Um, and for example, with the previous example with um, Allied Irish Bank, 
if we're to do, if we, or they actually had to do this um, when they when they retired the equipment, these systems that we're looking after. But it would take 2.3 years to roll out seven and a half thousand workstations with a team of eight, and that's kind of a bit sobering when you start doing the math. And that's averaging two two uh, machines a day, which might be low, but then again, you start thinking about project management and travel to each the site and et cetera, et cetera. But imagine if your workstations are single board computers locked in in uh, more or less inaccessible co telecom co uh, cabinets. You're going to want to have a level of automation. Um, I'm not sure how many 5G uh, systems are going to be, or 5G masts are going to be deployed across countries, but it's a lot. So with Allied Irish Bank, we did 7,500 desktops, um, 900 branches, and we did it with two people. Um, we inherited their deployment system, and our, our original ask was to de re remote replacement with one brand of Linux with another for disk and RAM reasons because of the age of the equipment, and they didn't want to spend the money building the, uh, or sending people out to replace the hardware. Um, so as much as we all want to see Linux on the desktop, we just thought, well, that was great, um, but no one really wants it. We've, we've tried. Uh, and then a bank, another bank called, uh, and they wanted 20,000 desktops in the, own, in the UK alone. Uh, we're, we're called uh, simply because the, the, the vendor of of the, Lin the Linux vendor said, pointed the bank at, at us and said, you know, talk to them, these guys have done it for another bank. Um, but it, usually it's a large user count in dispersed locations and they're usually using uh, either a web, a web system, um, a monolithic application in, in Java because they do single, single tasks. They don't do, they're not running Office or they're not running, they just have things such as just uh, the tank, bank teller and, um, application. So, with this new plan, we or new uh, customer, we thought well, we, we can't use the old um, Perl scripts mainly because uh, I don't read Perl uh, and I don't want to ever read Perl. Um, but the whole idea of a Pixie Boot to install to do the a script and install was something quite interesting. They were uh, the uh, AIB were using uh, LDAP for the management of the systems, um, but instead of having a CLI, uh, we wanted to have a, a graphical front end um, and do some some interesting things with that because we could see the, the potential of the system. Uh, so we built it. It all kind of kind of worked. A bit of a mess. Uh, and that's because the scope of what we're trying to do is huge. It's multiple servers on the client side. It's at least a minimum of four uh, with no redundancy. Um, double that if you want uh, a much higher reliability level. Um, weeks and weeks of, of consulting time, and that really limits the potential of, you know, you need to go to massive organizations to get to that point. So we needed to re-architect. Um, and mainly because the physical server requirements are too big or the, the, local, the local area network needed too many virtual machines. Um, so we cut that down to eight, uh, to one, um, and we moved a lot of the operations to cloud. And that reduced the installation consulting time to one of, you know, a couple of days, which is bad for the consulting side, but it's also good because you've got a much larger customer base. Um, now, one of the key things is this use of, of, um, of LDAP or Active Directory, um, which I'll get to shortly. But So we're using Django. We used a Django uh, uh, plugin, which now allows for multi-tenant Postgres. So it's a single database with multiple um, tenants built into it, all of which is secure against each other. Um, there's a secure virtual machine we put in inside that creates a VPN to our cloud instance, um, MQTT, 
you name it. Um, at the end of the day, every single system is connected to Active Directory if that's what the customer wants, um, or LDAP uh, for management, um, for both by us and also by the by the, uh, their user base. Um, which is where we now we get to the point where we start talking about Kiwi, and I'd love to use a pointer, but not too, it's not bright enough. Um, but essentially, the way Kiwi works is you build a, a virtual machine just from, uh, or you build a, a system image from uh, uh, simply an, X, uh, an XML dis description file, and you overlay it with, uh, with whatever files you want at the time where it's all combined. Um, and then you can define the version of the, of the hypervisor, uh, in our case, and just deliver it. And we were basically templating that uh, on a per customer basis. So the client would get the pre-built system, there was almost no configuration to be done. Um, and the XML file looks like that. Um, and I think I've just discussed that. I mean, the description files are easy to template uh, and manipulate. Um, and it takes about 20, in, in our systems, it takes about 20 minutes to build a system. Uh, that's what it looks like um, at the moment, more or less. Um, we've got a few things such as uh, it, it gets the nodes from LDAP, um, it gets the, uh, the organizational units from, from LDAP, uh, and in, injects it into our database. Um, gives you various, various uh, statistics about how many things are up and down. Um, it kind of works like this, but that's not really very helpful. Um, so essentially what happens is the client device boots in a pixie mode, and then it asks for a DHCP address. DHCP address supplies, it, it gives it an IP address and some other information. That extra information tells the client who to talk to for further boot information. So the, the Pixie app says, hey, I'm, I'm MAC address. Um, you know, what have you got for me? And usually there's a file that just gives the information. What we do is combine the old app uh, information that we have on file or in, in, the, in, the, file, in the database with its MAC address and go, oh, that MAC address, uh, uh, that belongs to that workstation and that workstation is part of this group. So this group gets this XML file if it's SUSE or a text file, which is uh, for Red Hat and Ubuntu, that deploys that particular system remotely onto that workstation. Um, and in Active Directory, um, very fuzzy, but uh, here you've got the, the folder. Um, in, or the, uh, the OU in, inside Active Directory, and by taking one of those, those systems over there, you drag and drop it into, the, into the, the appropriate folder, and next time the machine is restarted, it becomes the identity of what you want that system to look like. So if you just want a basic Red Hat or SUSE or Ubuntu system, you just drag one of those systems into there, if you've got wake on LAN enabled on the systems, you, press, you can actually press a wake on button, a wake button, it wakes it up and installs it. But there are still lots of problems, mainly to do with, uh, there's a lot of front loaded complexity, even though we tried to build a system that, that was, you, the client would download it based on a, a bunch of information uh, that, that were provided, it took, still too, took long, too long to install. Um, one of the biggest problems that we've come across is the identity, the virtualization, the network, and the end, u end user compute teams just, they, they don't want to talk to each other. Um, in fact, in AIB, when we're, when, when we're on our way out, we ended up with, a, uh, I think, three of those. One of those teams was from a, a third party network provider, that was the, the, yeah, the network. Virtualization team was in-house. End user compute teams were another, a different uh, third-party supplier. 
and identity was also in house. So all these people trying to get them all in front of the uh, in, in the same room at the same time is actually really difficult, and that's actually that will probably be the biggest the biggest problem you'd face. So apart from that previous uh, statement about you know trying to s solve the tech the uh, the issues of complexity. I was setting up a, an online bank account and I was amazed by how simple what is essentially a fairly complex uh, operation had, has become on, on this web banking uh, scenario. Um, so I thought, well, if we can get, a lot of the questions can be asked, a lot of the questions we need, we, we thought we needed in, in the, in the, initially to get things set up could wait till after. So we had this a web interface to build the system uh, and then after the the system is is complete, uh, then we can we can it, it, there'll be a wizard and it it just defines the the basic uh, setup, uh, which is also when we discovered something called Cage, which was featured at a previous OpenSUSE uh, event. Uh, that is a sing it's a kiosk app that has well it's a single desktop app, um, uh, so a window window manager. Uh, and so if your, sorry, so if uh, your app was a, a web browser, um, oh, wrong one, then you can use that. And we thought, we thought of that in regard to the console that people that are faced with on our system. Because that's kind of, a lot of people are not used to working uh, with uh, the Linux com command line, the uh, Admin, Windows admins get quite scared of it, so we thought we'd replace that normal console with a simple web browser running Cage, which is very low low footprint in terms of of disk and, and memory. Um, we could have just it's much friendlier, and with uh, simple jo uh, web web based actions to to fix problems, uh, and also. Push me messages to the browser uh, if you're if you're um, if you're making it available over the LAN. Um, of course, if you're connected to the internet, you can't do web uh, push messages, but that's life. So some of the things we've done with it, um, it kind of makes possible. It makes almost anything possible. You've got a lot of hardware. You've got a network connecting them. Um, what do you want to deploy onto it? Um, if you want to be really, really, I mean, this is one example. So, and we're doing this for a, for a customer at the moment. So we boot a, a, a memory resident kernel and run cage. And yeah, we run cage, and then on top of that, we run vert viewer. And the vert viewer instance connects to a virtual machine, which happens to be running Windows 7. <coughs> um, because of the pass-through abilities of uh, KVM and the vert viewer, we can plug the USB key into it and it can be recognized, the UB key can be recognized in the virtual machine. And that was something that, that our, our clients really quite like. Um, so this is a bit of a, 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 an example. You might be thinking, oh, it's a big deal. It allows you to virtualize anything, even client systems. Um, you can store the images where it makes sense to do so, close to the edge or centralized or on a combination of both. Um, this is just sort of to show you that it, it is actually running Windows, uh, running, running Linux, because the next thing you'll see is a Windows setup screen. Now, not. I'm not advocating you set up Windows ever, anyway. Um, but it does mean that you can run anything anywhere. Uh, almost, it's almost uh, limitless, the, the possibilities. So some of the tools we've used to do this, um, uh, or the, the tools we've developed uh, uh, in order to make all this possible. There's a client, there's a carpet sync server, and that's an all-in-one VM, which is the thing that's installed on the customer side. 
It provides Pixie Boot, Wake on a LAN, MQTT, and, and more, more features. Uh, I think there's also a, um, I can't remember the name of it. It, it's, it, it does everything, essentially. Um, we've got some predefined images that we can deploy over, over Pixie. Uh, that does things like the, ins the inspector app is, or the inspector image ra it runs in RAM only. It collects all the information uh, from, the, from the, uh, the hardware using something like D DMI decode or, or, or whatever it might be. Um, sends it using MQTT up to the server and the server stores it all in the database. So you've actually then got a an audit of, of, of all the machines. And then once it's done, it just reboots the system and it goes back to its, to its uh, original operating system. It doesn't touch the hard disk at all, which is perfect, if you, especially if you've got a, a wake on LAN uh, environment already deployed with uh, Pixie Boot. You can just put this in the Pixie Boot server and it just you can get all this information. Um, there's something else called, we've called floorboard, which is something you saw previously in that previous slide. Um, and that is just the base level of Pixie bootable image that will do anything you want to do. So for in, 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 in the case that I've just shown you, it's running a, a, um, a vert viewer instance on cage. Um, it could be running a cage with a web browser, so you've got a kiosk running uh, using the system, or you could have it running a, a web browser that is uh, pointed at um, Microsoft 365 or whatever uh, internal application you might have. Uh, and it also provides um, Spice accelerated front end to the virtual, the KVM virtual machine if that's what you're using. Um, we developed something called uh, Carpet Sync, which is actually the application that the, carpet, the sync server uses. Um, it integrates, so it, there's a, a, an MQTT server Inside, that, inside the virtual machine, it talks to that, it looks at, uh, sends requests and responses in terms of are there any centralized calendar events that need to be run on these particular machines. Um, it's, it's the thing that sits in the, inside the, the local area network and sends wake on land messages, um, et cetera. So uh, and then there's carpet agent, which is an optional thing, it's not really required but it's handy to have it running on a, on a uh, deployed workstation so then you get constant up updates onto, as to uh, the, the health of the system. Uh, again, using MQTT. Um, so the interesting tools we've encountered in the, in the, uh, during the construction of this project, um, of course there's Kiwi. Um, it's an, an open SUSE, uh project, um, we can build, we've been using it to build a whole lot of VMs and pixel bootable images and, and, and even physical machines, it's, it's really good. Um, Noitka, which a lot of people might not have heard of, it's a Python compiler which deconstructs the, the Python that's given, turns it into C and then compiles it as C. Increases the speed of Python by about, um, I've, I've heard, about 500%. Uh, um, and it also, it, it generates, you don't need the Python um, interpreter. It builds all that into the binary. Um, and it binary images, or it's like monolithic binary, binary image or with libraries. Uh, and you can just uh, install that on anything. Um, and we use that to, for the carpet agent and the carpet sync server. Um, and cage which we've already discussed on previous, uh, previously. Uh, that's the kiosk compositor for Wayland. Um, and that's very good as well. Needs a bit of love, but it's, it's, a, it's a really good, good system. Now Django, I'm not sure how many of you have uh, heard of it or used it. Um, it's a fantastic uh, web, web development platform. Um, we've used it since point eight. Uh, it's now four and five. Uh, Django with the multi-tenant, uh, Django multi-tenant um, app, it's, it turns your, your, your single database into a multi-tenanted, full-on 
just a, an amazing piece of code where you can have certain tables that are shared and some of them are private to different, for different customers. Um, and MQTT, um, which is a great uh, message queuing uh, protocol. Uh, the, the server that we use is uh, Mosqui yeah, Mosquito D, um, MQ. Uh, and that's web so sockets capable. So the, one of the slides I showed you before, um, a lot of the information was being driven by red web sockets um, real time. Um, and if you're running the agent, uh, it, return, they, it, runs, it reports back to the local server via the MQ server. And I'm, that's about it. I'm a bit, uh, a bit ahead of time. Has anyone got any questions? I guess not. Well, I've made Doug very happy because I'm ahead of time, not behind. So um, that's, the, that's the QR code if uh, anyone wants more information. And that's it. Thank you.